necessarily his favorite steak. Uh, but we, you know, at the same time, a lot of us don't know a lot about his, his time in Buffalo. And, uh, I think they recently found something at Buffalo that uh, there was some controversy over who was going to claim it. That's right. This is on the manuscript. The manuscript, uh, the original manuscript, I think, of Huck Finn, wasn't it? That's right. And in fact, the Historical Society had, I, want, I don't know if it was Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer, Frank, I'm a little vague on this, but had half of the manuscript in its possession. And the other half, was, I think, may have been part of that California find. Or was that just the, well, I uh, think that was what was considered to be the lost chapter, lost as I understand it. And it was at South of Beezer, Christie's was going to auction it off, and uh, uh, the Historical Society got very much involved, and I think, I don't know whether they ultimately got it back, or I should say got it back then, and there was a legal issue of who had title to it, and yeah. it got to be very complicated. Did it wind up at um, Elmira College? I, I think ultimately that was, the, that was where they agreed that it would not go out to auction. Mm -hmm. Uh, if that negotiated its way to a college, yeah. But that's, uh, but anyway, that's, that's interesting. Uh, tell me a little bit, what your recollections are of Mark Twain working his way up to, to Buffalo, New York? Ultimately, why did he get there? And what is, what the well, right here? You know, we go back to his, I guess, around 1867 at which point he was uh, on the, what was referred to as the Quaker City Cruise. Mm -hmm. Quaker City, the name of a side wheel, sail, steam powered sailing ship. And uh, it was his responsibility to write travel letters to a newspaper that had hired him from California for whom he once worked. And um, while on the Quaker City, he met a young man by the name of Charlie Langdon. Charlie was from Elmira, New York. Mm -hmm. Charlie, from a wealthy family, his father's name was Jervis, and he uh, um, had a, a sister by the name of Olivia. He and, he and Sam chatted in their stateroom one afternoon, or his stateroom, and during that conversation, he showed him this photograph of his family, and one of which was Olivia Langdon. And uh, so approximately a year later, Sam was invited to their home in Elmira. And that's when he met Olivia for the first time. And uh, he fell in love with her. Actually, I think, if the truth is known, he probably fell in love with the photograph first. Yeah. He was really impressed by her. And uh, there's a lot of information about his courting and, and in his autobiography he makes some remarks as to how that came about, whether he sort of maybe uh, embellished it somewhat or not, who knows, but in any event, uh, they were married. I think they married in February of 1870. And uh, Jervis Langdon, his fa now his father-in-law, was reasonably wealthy. He made a lot of money during the Civil War in the lumber and coal business. Originally, they had uh, negotiated with a fellow by the name of Mr. Fairbanks, his first name escapes me, but his wife's name is Mary Fairbanks, to purchase a partial partnership in the newspaper that he owned in Cleveland, Ohio. I think it was the Plain Dealer, I could be corrected on that. And at, uh, after a while, Mr. Fairbanks sort of backed out of that deal with mm -hmm. So then Jervis Langdon secured for Sam a partnership or a part ownership in the Buffalo Express in Buffalo, New York. And uh, at the same time, unbeknownst to Sam, he purchases a home for him on Delaware Avenue. And it's a, sort of interesting to hear that story, how they arrived in the winter and then sleigh in the snow. And, and uh, there they were at this house, and he walks in and finds out there's a deed to it. And uh, he lived there in Buffalo along about 73 or 74, if my, correct, my memory is correct. But he, he didn't like Buffalo so much. What was he said? Uh, it's too cold. Mm -hmm. And he said, if the thermometer had been an inch longer, we would have frozen to death. <laughs> but in any event, then at that point, they left Buffalo and moved to Hartford. And 
well, they resided in Hartford with, uh, again, the name escapes me at the moment, but well, he had uh, a new home design, drawn up the plans, and uh, was built there on Farmington Avenue uh, next to Harriet Beecher Stowe's home. And it was, a, it was sort of a place where his, uh, his publisher was there, Elijah Bliss, and also it was made him more acceptable mm -hmm. to the literary community. And uh, had he had already written Huckleberry Finn and Tom mm -hmm. Sawyer? Tom Sawyer was written in 1874. And Huck Finn was not completed, was not published until 1886. And that book took him about seven years to write it. So what would that be? About 1879 when he would start, when he started on it? Tom Sawyer, just trying to put that in a Buffalo context, probably was written during that period of time or published during that period of time? Would that be? I think it was published in 1874. So which would have meant he would have started on it prior to then, of course. Mm -hmm. But I think, a, I don't know how much of it was written at Quarry Farm, but Quarry Farm was a, uh, a farm over near Elmira, New York, that sat up on the hill, overlooked the valley there. And that was owned by, by Theodore and uh, Susan Crane. Mm -hmm. And Susan was, uh, if my memory is correct, was an adopted child of Jervis Langdon. And uh, they would have the Clemens family come over and spend the summers at the uh, quarry farm. As a matter of fact, Susan had built for him out uh, overlooking the valley there an octagon-shaped study. Beautiful. And he could raise up the windows and sort of give one a look of a pilot house, so to speak. You know, and he would take the bricks and weight his papers down and his manuscripts and, and that which he was working on. And he would spend his morning hours out there in the study, un, uh, un, uh, alone, not bothered, and uh, he would write. And I think a portion of uh, Tom Sawyer was written there in the out in the study. And uh, now it's down on the campus at Elmira. Have you been there? Yes. Yeah. It's really well done. Yeah. And uh, Quarry Farm now has turned into a uh, center for Mark Twain studies. Wonderful place. Just, I mean, to walk in that gives me cold chills, you know. And to walk through the home in Hartford. Now, I've never been to the one. There used to be a restaurant, I think, in, in uh, uh, Buffalo mm -hmm. for a while. I, I think that's closed now. And I, and, uh, but uh, those were his Buffalo years, and if more transpired there, well, a lot was happening uh, while he was in Buffalo. Uh, his oldest son died. Mm -hmm. uh, his eldest, uh, 18 months old. A uh, visitor came to see Livy, one of her friends. She died. Mm -hmm. Her father, Jervis, suddenly took ill and died. So he was, he was, the family was undergoing a tremendous amount of grief at that time, too. Oh, yeah. And maybe the grief had something to do. I don't know yeah. that we don't know about. Maybe that had entered into the decision to move. It certainly entered into the decision to move from a home in Hartford when Susie died. Mm -hmm. Susie, his oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, too, he was uh, he filed bankruptcy at that time, so that, that there's no money. Yeah. He moved to Europe because it was cheaper to live there. And um, that was after Susie's death. Just an aside, did Twain, did he get involved in the athletics at all? Did he follow athletics? Did he follow baseball, boxing? Did, did, did I don't think he did. did. The uh, the, the, his passion was billiards. Ah. Playing pool. He'd keep you up for all hours of the night and play pool with him. Right. He'd walk and smoke a cigar and walk around the table. He was a good pool player. Uh, I've often wondered, you know, there's, uh, if he made any comments about baseball. Uh, he did make a comment about golf. He said it's nothing more than a good walk spoiled. <laughs> but uh, other other sports, if he showed any compelling interest in them, I have not found it to be. What is politics? 
Did he wear that on his sleeve? What was it he said that he was uh, the party of, I can remember this, something to do with the donut? Are you familiar with it? I, I just don't know. He was, um, he was rather, I think, liberal in a lot of his ways, particularly as it, in, as it related to what are we, what, uh, capitalism. And uh, he wrote a book called The Gilded Age. And he says when gold was discovered in California, that was a turning point for that then man began to focus more on money than he did on other things. Mm -hmm. But uh, his politics, yeah, he had was good friends with U.S. Grant. And I suppose Grant was Republican. Very much so. And, uh, but uh, what was it he said? I'd rather go to bed with U.S. Grant in full uniform than I would with, um, what was her name? Uh, oh, she was a well-known actress in the time than I would with whatever her name is, let's say Lillian Gish, it wasn't Lillian Gish, but than I would with Lillian Gish, stark naked. Yeah. <laughs> but he had a lot of respect and admiration for President U.S. Grant, wrote, wrote, uh, printed his memoirs, as a matter of fact. That contributed to his bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, that and the page typesetter, and by the way, the, tape, the typesetter's in the house in the basement up there in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And one, one looks at the house, you know, when the first time I saw the house, my first thought was, uh, to me, it displays uh, an atmosphere of, I don't care what other people think, I'm going to do what I want to do. Sort of a liberal type attitude, perhaps. Mm -hmm. He didn't conform so much, even though the house was very Victorian on the inside, you go in the house and it's beautiful, just absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But uh, to look to look to the outside of it, it to me it looked, for lack of a better word, kind of gaudy. Yeah. Not that it was not attractive, but there was just something about it that made it stand out. He he did the same thing years later when he started wearing the white suit. Mm -hmm. What was it he said? I wanted to be the most conspicuous man on the planet, <laughs> and he had the nerve to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm an autograph collector, and I've got a, some some stuff that. Um, and um, often he would autograph. Uh, you see those hexes where he, he'd autograph Samuel Clemens, you know, coming down, and then he'd autograph him almost different, different hand almost, still his hand, but Mark Twain. So they it crossed. So Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. That was how he would autograph variously for people. So sort of like a trademark. Yeah. Do you think? And uh, you, you look very distinctive. I mean, all the Mark Twain's look one way, all the Samuel Clemens look one way, but they're really different. Uh, so this is the other state, you know, the pseudonym, and then, of course, his, his real personality. So if you go to a, again, documentary, if you just occasionally see autographs somewhere, and they, in fact, cross like that, the next, that's how he did it. Crazy. Well, he was certainly a unique individual. You're a unique individual. You know, I, I've enjoyed living, listening to your River Lorian, and last night you brought down the house. I don't know if, uh, if you meant to be so personal about how your, your seemingly relationship with Mark Twain with your personal life and your son David, uh, but that was very, very poignant. Well, it's not intended to be poignant, but uh, it's true. Yeah. And it's a very touching thing, and it's very hard for me to do that. But it keeps my battery charged, and it keeps me in touch with who I am, where it, where it all began. People say, well, have you ever thought about trying to market what you do? No, because it'd be almost blasphemous, sacrilegious to do that. Mm -hmm. I do, and that's how, that's how it all came about for me. And, you know, uh, I was up at Quarry Farm, and one of the ladies up there at the, you know, at the college took myself and a friend uh, with this company up, and she talked about uh, the number of people that are Mark Twain impersonators, and they have a group that comes up there uh, that come up to the college every year, and they choose, I think, who the one who looks the best, sounds the best, or mm -hmm. does the best, what have you. She called them Twainiacs, mm -hmm. and I suppose 
uh, that's maybe where I fit. I'm a Twainy act. But I probably have a reason different than most people for being that. Yes, exactly. And uh, uh, Hal Holbrook started his one-man show of Mark Twain. Uh, my gosh, what, 1948, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't care how many of us out here are doing him. There's a, everywhere I go, well, I saw so-and-so. I was in Nevada, and there was a fellow in a white suit doing Mark Twain. I was here and there and yonder. But who, whomever, whatever they are, wherever they are, they all have to give credit to Holbrook because he started the thing. And I, uh, I try, and what I do, I try to use material that I don't think he uses or that I'm aware that he uses. And I also try to present a different type of atmosphere and that I, would, I want it to be informal. I want to create a feeling of friendship and warmth and that Sam Clements is actually sitting in his home and he has all these friends that come over mm -hmm. and he wants to talk to him and he, uh, he, he just likes to share with him with them about his life his uh, tragedies he trusts them he uh, you know and that's how I try to that's the atmosphere I tried to create instead of it being a lecture and that I'm lecturing about a given subject yeah. talking about his life you were very, very successful, <coughs> and I think people recognize the fact that you've really researched it. I mean, you're, you're more, it's certainly Hal Holbrook uh, clearly created the one-man show and had to do some research, but I assume once that was over with, it, it became rote to him. I mean, he, he had his presentation, he had his show, uh, but you've obviously researched it, you've gone beyond it, you live in here in the Mississippi, uh, in the Ohio. You've taken a many steps beyond that. You're living it. Well, I spent uh, my time with my books. Yeah. That was my escape. Yeah. Uh, healing. I don't know. You know, it's... Uh, yeah. And I have a lot of admiration for the man, and I just wish more people did. They could read him and understand. You know, really, one of the things about that when I got involved with Sam Clemens, if you don't mind me sharing this little sure. story with you, I have the most wonderful grandmother that could ever live. Loved her, Effie Rose. And uh, we kids, we children, my brothers and sisters and cousins. And, uh, she's Southern Baptist. And she was uh, strict but not, not puritanical. She mm -hmm. was rigid but fair. And she, li she lived and set the example for her children and her grandchildren. And she remembered Sam Clemens. She was a little girl when Sam Clemens was alive. Grandma was born 1886, so she would have been uh, 14 years old when he passed away. And she called me to, sh one day, uh, she called me and she said, Lois, I want you to come by and see me. I want to talk to you. And I stopped at her home, and she was sitting in the living room quilting. I'll never forget it. And she said, Lewis, I understand that you have been spending a lot of time with Sam Clemens. And I said, yes, I've been reading it quite a bit. Well, I want to tell you he was the son of the devil. He was an atheist. What's the name of the lady O'Hara? Madeline O'Hara quotes Sam Clemens. And I want you to leave him alone. Stay away from him before he ruins you. Well, I respected her wishes, but I wanted to find out for myself what, what I... And you know, the more I've read and the more I've studied and, and little bits and pieces, I think he had the genius to question much of which we're taught and, and the, many of those things that we're taught we accept and we accept it on that word of faith, mm -hmm. accept it by faith. Uh, I think he questioned some of those things and did so in a way that would cause one to stop and think and look at another side. Mm -hmm. And I think Sam Clemens 
believe that we all did not just happen that this creation did not just happen however he questioned somewhat did it happen the way in seven days and did it you know and then at the, towards the end of his life he said he made a remark for several of them actually but one of which was I do not believe there is such place as a heaven and almost as an afterthought he said but I do expect to go there and uh, I have my own beliefs my own personal beliefs and uh, I consider myself well I consider myself a Christian but even Sam remarked on that he said if Christ were to come back here today there's one thing he would not be and that's a Christian because he saw the hypocrisy he saw through it and uh, identified it spoke about it and he did so in a unique way and that's where his genius was what do you say about Baptist I, I, being a Baptist I listened to it last time I read well that uh, that remark <laughs> uh, I I use that because he didn't say that I'm paraphrasing out of my own and I, yeah. I do that for a reason because he was Presbyterian his mother was and he referred to being a Presbyterian in his early life and uh, and, uh, and that it was uh to have a conscience of the Presbyterian, you know, it's a curse. And then so, I, in order for the people who may be in the audience hearing me and thinking that I'm uh, picking on one, I'm selecting a <laughs> one group yes. to identify and make fun of, I try to correct it. Mm -hmm. I try to show them that I'm not just singling them out. And so I use this thing about the Baptist and the Methodist. And... Uh, that was something I found in somewhere along the way in my reading, but it had nothing. Yeah. Mark Twain did not say that. <laughs> that's funny. But that's the reason for it. But it always gets a laugh. Yeah. Has any of your other family, have they gotten into this at all? Have they uh, followed Twain or you? Or they well, my youngest son, who took, I guess, can you take the place of uh, someone you lose? Yeah. Probably not, but not really. But he... Uh, he came, Jason came along after David passed away. I'll never forget, uh, he was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, Jason, why don't you, I'll be going around to schools and churches and civic clubs and doing this little one-man piece and talking about uh, something similar to what you saw. Yeah. And I said, why would you, uh, how would you like to be Huckleberry Finn? And uh, you go with Dad and we'll have fun. And you memorize this, and you come out as the Huck Finn character. And you do such and such part. Instead of me doing it, you do it. Well, Daddy said, I don't know. He said, I'll have to think about it. Now, he's eight years old. Yeah. And a little bit later, he came to me, and he was wanting a tape recorder. So he bargained. And he said, Dad, if you'll buy me a tape recorder, I'll do it. I did. So we... Uh, I wrote out something, and he remember worked on it, worked on it, memorized it. And until he was 16 years old, just about every show I did, he went with me for about eight years. And he would come out on the stage and wearing the costume and the homemade suspenders and barefoot and the corn cob pipe. And he would go through that Huck Finn story as I, much as I did the other night. And it was a blessing. It really filled the void. Other than that, no, no one else. But it, it was really uh, made for a good time. And you know, as an afterthought, you know, to try to get out of that Huckleberry Finn presentation, the portion that I used, and because you can't go on and on and on, Huck says, if you want to find out anything more about my book, or find anything about my adventures, why don't you buy the book? And just plant that little seed. The books in the gift shop just go. Choo, 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 choo. They buy, you know. And uh, and so what's that doing for me? It's making me feel good if that happens because I know that somebody's buying the book and they're taking Huckleberry Finn home now and perhaps reading that book in a different light.
sure. seeing a different, having a different interpretation of its contents as what they would if they were a child. Well, we ran it, uh, ironically, the night before you did it for the kids, the first few chapters, which is what, what you did there, about the time, I'm sorry. And so the kids, were, we read it to them. And then when you did it on stage, talk about, you know, making that impression on them. They all said, man, you know, they could now follow you, follow what you did. It was terrific. And also you mentioned earlier that you're, uh, you know, the first person worrying about the life on the Mississippi. You can't find it in the bookstore. It's, just, it's gone. It's gone. I know, they sold every one of them. <laughs> And it's good for me, and I, you know, I, uh, I just think we're being spoiled because we don't read anymore. You know, it's a shame. Or the younger generation, all they want to do is watch TV, and much of what they're seeing on TV is not fit to watch. I'm yeah. sorry, but that's the way I feel. And to to curl up with a book and to develop your reading skills, and the next thing that's going to be gone now is our writing. We won't. Have Writing will be the thing of the past because of the computer. And is that good or bad? Well, what are we going to do if we run out of electric? I don't know. But um, well, it dulls the mind. Frankly, business writing, any kind of writing, there's no creativity to it, there's no imagination to it. Uh, you know, when you read, again, maybe it's my autograph, but I buy this stuff. You know, read it, and King's English is so, so wonderful. Always so colorful, and now it's declarative sentences is what they teach people. You know, short, bing, bing, bing. If you want to get your message across, it's not going to give you any additional stuff. You know. I think if I were, uh, and uh, uh, very quickly, now just add this on to your, for, for what it's worth. Sure, it's perfect. Uh, books that I would suggest, and the one that's uh, turned me into a uh, fanatic. Uh, Mr. Clemens and Mark Twain. That was written by Justin Kaplan. And another book that wonderful, it's no longer in print. It's such a shame that it's no longer in print. Shame that you can't buy that book anymore. And that's uh, Mark Twain, God's Fool, written by Hamlin Hill. You may be able to get it in your library. But it's just, it's a, it deals with the last 10 years of Sam Clemens' life. And, uh, and then his autobiography, to read that about what he had to say about himself. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Just wonderful. And the death of Jean, the last chapter, the death of his, la of his youngest daughter. Mm -hmm. And how he was able to, to, it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of work. Incorporated in that grief, that grieving period, he nearly ready for the grave himself. He found a way of making us chuckle. Sprinkling a little bit of humor in a tragic situation that did not take away from the, the from the grieving of, that one would endure, you know. And then uh, oh gosh, the books he wrote. How in the world? That's another thing. How in the name of heaven could one man write as much as he wrote and do most all of it by longhand? Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. They get one to sit down and write and turn and generate and turn out. Now that was he did. And then there's a book uh, written about his mother. The author's name escapes me. I have it. And to read that and the work, the research that has gone into it by this lady who's uh, uh, from northern Kentucky, I think, Fort Mitchell, Fort Park Hills, or somewhere up in that area, wrote about Sam Clemens' mother and, uh, and of course, his father up until he died and when he was 47 years old. But his mother had such an important part in Sam's humorous disposition is in my opinion I think the way she saw things he picked up from his mom because she too had a unique way of describing something seeing things and expression expressing she too talked 
very slow, drawn out. And Sam, as I see him, spoke his words as though he was trying to select each one, mm -hmm. causing him then for one to have a feeling that he was a, and that was, a, that was a, he would keep the, even in his young years, he would keep the kid sitting on the end of their seat waiting for him. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we, we could talk for hours. I could just talk and talk and talk, Sam. What's next if we, you know, you do this, uh, do you have any sense that you'd want to go on the road, or is this where you want to be? You know, I don't know. I've often thought uh, perhaps someday, I don't, I'm, I just take each day as it comes. Sure. I've thought maybe someday if, uh, I was ever given the opportunity to use this skill to contribute to the leukemia society or to a hospital for children. I'd reached the height of it all. I'm sorry. I appreciate that. God bless you for doing that. I, I should be a better uh, control of my emotions right now, I suppose, but that's, uh, I can't help it. No, and I don't think my, my, uh, I, I would bet there were a few people came up with to you afterwards who, uh, yesterday afternoon, probably mentioned that they'd lost children. And, uh, uh, that is, uh, my, my grandfather, my mom's is uh, 15 year old, and, and Destroyed. I mean, in a sense, there's, there's no replacing it. Burying one of your own. When you think about Sam Clemens, literally, he outlived five of his six. Well, he had four, and he uh, he outlived all but one. Yeah. Uh, Langdon died 18 months. Susie 24. I think Jean was what 34, somewhere in the 30s. And Clara was the only one to outlive him. There's another tragedy in that story. Clara's daughter, Nina, Nina, never married, never had kids. I think probably, uh, as I as I read it and as I see it, Clara was uh, Clara and Ossip were so much in love with each other. Little Nina was neglected somewhere. That I could be wrong. Again, that's just my own personal observation by reading what I've read about them. And uh, she was in the limelight. She was, after all, Mark Twain's daughter. And, uh, and Nina died at the age of 54 of an overdose of drugs and alcohol. Never married, no children. That's the end of the line. End of the line. When you stop to think then and you go from that point and you go all the way back to Mark Twain's mother, Jane, and Richard Barrett, her true love, that for some, this, was there a reason? Or is it just happenstance? Yeah. And was, was it somehow another plan that we would have in our midst, Samuel Langhorn Clemens, who would generate these words for our entertainment, our thought, our consideration, you know, because had it just been, had that letter just been given to Jane by Lewis, your Uncle Lewis, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Hard to figure out. Well, thank you for allowing me to share some of this with you. I my deep apologies for thank you. becoming overly emotional. I it's just a very sensitive thing. I, uh, it's hard to control. And I'm going home in a few days and have a grandson, a couple of days, and have a oh, grandson yeah. there that, that uh, is very, very close to us. Terrific. Where is home? Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Okay. So would he get off here at uh, Cincinnati? Get off of Cincinnati.
and I'm only like an hour's drive or a little less from home. Uh, is you, uh, you stay at home and you have that place and the, the kids, you have what, one, Jason? Children? I have three children. Three children. Uh, one of them's a police officer, one of them's driving the truck, the other one just got out of the Marine Corps. Right. Right. And, uh, so it would be good to get back. Tough to be on the road though, uh, on the river, I guess. It's both. I get a lot of uh, satisfaction and comfort out of it. Because I get to meet. Uh, I, I, really, I get to meet wonderful people, sure, sure. and I get to share something with them. Something that I um, feel very strongly about. You know, and it probably comes across because I feel it. Yeah. And um, where else can I go do be a river lorian at home? There's no call for. Them. So for as long as I had the enthusiasm and the health and uh, contribute, I guess I'll stay. I remember I seeing you on the Mississippi Queen. You did this around 1989 or 1990. In fact, the kids walk on it. Oh, he looks familiar. They didn't know the term Reverend but he was a no historian. Yeah. Is that right? That's right. So you were, you were immediately recognized when you walked on the floor. Well, I thank you for allowing me to share some of my... Perfect. Did you have a card? Uh, and if so, uh, I'll, I'll... They've got some stuff in the Buffalo Historical Society about his time in Buffalo, and I'll send that to you, and you can just put it in the library. And I'll be happy to. I'll get you a card. I'll slip it under your door. I'll, I'll see walk you back down. I don't have one. Wait.